Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Financial Advisors Workshop. And Financial Advisors Workshop, hosted by Four Star Wealth and your host, Brian Castle. We we interview um, some really interesting and very professional financial advisors all around America. Um, there are literally millions of people that have accounts with financial advisors, and they and the people that serve them are often people who don't get uh, a lot of profile. And so we're attempting to show our the best of our industry by the Financial Advisors Workshop. And today uh, is is uh, is is certainly a great example of a great financial advisor. We've got Damon King with us. Damon is down in Oklahoma. Uh, Damon, welcome to the Financial Advisors Workshop. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Well, it's it's great to, there's something in the water there in Oklahoma. There's some incredible people down there. And uh, I'm up in Chicago at our headquarters, as you know. Um, but uh, you've got quite a, uh, a profile down there and you're in Oklahoma City. Um, you're in a, a suburb called Edmond, where apparently there's a par- fairly affluent crowd of folks, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. So, so Damon, um, you know, how did you get started in this business? Uh, th- this is an important thing to learn, yeah. and that'll lead up to where you are now and how you're serving clients. So, I'll answer that uh, in two parts. There's what inspired me to get into this business, and then you know, I, I can share how I actually got into it. Uh, what inspired me was that uh, by the time I was 24 years old, I found myself $17,000 in credit card debt. Okay. I had uh, made a lot of stupid choices with my money. Um, part of that was paying uh, college expenses towards the end right before I graduated. But then, of course, you know, what do you do when you graduate? You got to move into a townhouse with your buddies and you got to get all the cool furniture and you got to turn it into the place where all the ladies are going to want to hang out, right? So, we had a great time for about a year, and uh, that uh, fast and loose lifestyle cost a lot. And so a few years go by, and you know, I'm driving home one night. I graduated, and I was working uh, at that time in the banking industry. Driving home, and I noticed I'm on empty. My gas, my, my gas tank is empty in the car. And as I pull up to the gas station, I realize, okay, I just paid my rent. I just paid my car payment, and I paid my piddly little minimum payment on my credit card. I don't have any money left. How am I going to buy gas? So I start doing what any normal person would do. I start rummaging around in my car to find any loose change or uh, maybe a spare dollar that fell down. And I literally found 40 cents. I found 40 cents and I walked into the gas station and I, I kind of quietly leaned over and I said, I need 40 cents on pump three. You know, I didn't want to be, I didn't, I didn't want anybody to hear it, you know? And he said, what? I said, I need 40 cents on pump three. And, you know, anyway, he he finally got it. And uh, Brian, I don't know when the last time was you pumped 40 cents worth of gas, but uh, it goes pretty quickly. OK, it's 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 like one squeeze, like a, a quarter squeeze of the pump. Yeah, one squeeze and then. Yeah. It, yeah, then it's over. Right. So I did that. I got back in my car and uh, in probably one of my lowest moments ever. I just sat there for about five minutes and I just bawled my eyes out, you know, because. <laughs> I was asking myself, how did I get to this point? How did I allow this to happen? And and that's the key. I allowed it to happen. These were self-inflicted wounds. This wasn't, oh, Damon grew up in a uh, in a disadvantaged life and his parents never talked about money. You know, we, we never really did talk about money in my family. But my mom and dad. Else, right? You can't blame anybody else. Right. I had nobody to blame but myself. Right. So that meant. Nobody else was going to get me out of this but myself. So I had my little pity party for about five minutes. And finally, I decided, you know what? This is ridiculous. This can't stand. So I drove back to my apartment, which was just around the corner. And I thought, what am I going to do? And a thought occurred to me. It's like, well, you don't have any money. You don't have a girlfriend. You don't have a social life. You're not doing anything. Go get a second job. So I put on the one the one jacket that I own, the one suit, and it had a hole in the elbow. I remember that, you know, that's that's what I own. And I went down to the local shopping mall and I got a job 45 minutes later at a department store. And then later on, I actually added a third job on working overnight loading trucks, uh, shipping trucks. And I did that for about 18 months. And every spare dollar I made went towards the debt. But something else happened in that time. I went to the library a lot. Libraries are free. You know, it was free entertainment. And when I actually had some spare time, I went to the library and I started checking out books on 
getting out of debt first. But then as the debt started to melt away, I wanted to learn, okay, how do I build wealth? There's paying off debt and then there's building wealth. So I started checking out books on real estate investing and investing in the stock market. And then I wanted to learn about taxes. I didn't know how, I didn't know what a capital gain was. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know how all that worked. Um, I even started learning things about social security, and Medicare, and here I am in my mid twenties. I didn't know how any of that worked. And I just started educating myself and I realized, man, I really enjoy this stuff. This is fascinating to me. Very cool. Mean, yeah. there, there's a whole tax code of rules and laws I can use to my advantage. I thought it was a weapon to beat me in the head, you know, because that's what all of my friends said, you know, the, the system's just here to keep us down. And, and I bought into that. And then something even weirder started to happen. My friends and even some of my family members, they started coming to me for advice. I realized they're in debt too. And they started asking me, how'd you do this? What do you think I should do? I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you what I did. And that got me to thinking, you know, I've got a real calling here. I've got an opportunity. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I have an opportunity someday. If I'm ever put in a position to help other people avoid my stupid mistakes and also start to build wealth, I'm going to take that opportunity. Yeah. And so that opportunity came about uh, 12, 13 years later. And uh, in that in interim time, I actually worked in the nonprofit field. I was a professional fundraiser for 12 years. Oh. And, you know, I've met lots of people with wealth and lots of people with money. And at that time, I was asking them to invest in a charitable cause. But I never lost that desire to help them with other things. And I got into planned giving and started, started learning about estate planning and charitable giving through your estate. Mm. And that's when I thought, you know what? My time is coming. I want to become a financial advisor. And right. I want to help people here. And uh, I just decided, you know what? I'm going to make the, the leap. And so I remember it was 2010, September of 2010. I was going to apply for the CAP certification, the Chartered Advisor in Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to add that on. But then I saw this other certification and it said certified financial planner huh what is that that seems pretty cool i started reading about it man these are all the things i want to do brian i was stupid at that i had no idea how arduous and difficult that journey was going to be it's probably a good thing. if i'd known what i was gonna have to go through um I, I maybe i wouldn't have done it so uh ignorance was really bliss at that time but that's what got me on the the journey and uh you know, by 2014, I'd finished all that. I passed the CFP exam. I didn't have a job in this industry, and I didn't know what it was going to come from. But I got connected with uh, uh, with Victoria Woods, and she's the founder and CEO of our firm, Chapelwood Financial. We had a phone call, and the rest is history. I joined right. joined the firm. So, so just like you uh, started uh, answering questions and teaching members of your family. You've carved out a career involving a lot of teaching. Yeah, I have. Let's hear about that. That seems to be a theme. From so, what I can yeah, it is. And I and I love to teach. And really, I love to tell stories, which I did that a lot. You know, when you're a fundraiser, when you work in nonprofit, a lot of what you're doing is you're sharing stories of impact. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're sharing the return on investment. And I, I encourage... Uh, other people who work in the nonprofit world, I don't use the word, would you make a donation, a gift? A gift, the connotation there is I'm going to give you money for nothing. No, I, I expect something. I expect a return on my investment. And that return is a uh, change in the community, improvement in the lives of people. I simply transferred that storytelling over to what I do here. But now I'm asking people to make an investment and we're, we're going to help build wealth. And contrary to what I really believed, I just assumed that once I had the designation of certified financial planner professional, that the money would just start rolling in and people would just start throwing millions of dollars at me. Here, help me. That didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I began to realize that in all of my studies to get licensed, to get certified, 
one area that was never really taught a lot was marketing. You know, well, there weren't, I didn't take any classes on selling yourself. And what I have come to realize after 10 years or so of being in this business and just being self-employed, when you're in a business, especially early on, your primary role is marketing. Your job is marketing. That's what you're doing. And so I realized pretty early on, I need to make, I, I need to carve out a niche and not necessarily a niche type of client. I needed to do that as well. But how was I going to separate myself from the other thousands of advisors that are out there? Right. And so I thought, well, what are my strengths? Well, you know, I seem, I, I, I like myself. I think I'm a pretty personable person. Um, I love speaking. I love telling stories. Well, where do all those things intersect that intersects in teaching? And so in September of 2016, I had approached a local library here in uh, our, our city of Edmond. And I said, you know what? I want to come out and I want to teach a class at the library. Um, would you allow me to do that? And so I talked with them. They said, yeah, what do you want to talk about? I said, I want to talk about building wealth. Mm -hmm. and actually, it was taxes, I think. My very first class was called Disinheriting Uncle Sam. Okay. It was about it was about taxes because I knew no one's no one's going to come to a class called tax planning. Nobody wants to go to <laughs> class, okay? But disinheriting Uncle Sam, okay. Now I'm all in for that. They like that. That's right. So uh, I put that class together. We marketed it. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I get there, and there are three ladies in my class. So we teach the class. It took about an hour. And at the end of that, all three <laughs> ladies asked for my business card. And two of those ladies became my clients. Nice. In that moment, Brian, I realized this is my thing. This, sort of. this is it. This is my ticket. I can teach. And so I continued. Now I added on more. I went to, uh, that was the one library. Then I went to the entire uh, library system, the main office. And there are multiple libraries around. And then I started teaching in multiple libraries. And then I thought, well, now I can take this. And so I started teaching at churches. And then businesses started asking me to come in and teach. And then pretty soon, I found myself as an adjunct faculty member at a local school. And then I taught at a local university. And it all just built. And that teaching was how I delivered, um, how I delivered the concept of wealth building, tax efficiency, all the things that we talked about as advisors. I packaged it up through teaching and telling stories, uh, stories about my clients. And uh, that's that's worked really well for me. So you started out, if I understand, that was your first real teaching. Uh, no, but you teach in a lot of other areas now, right? So talk, look, tell us about all your teaching outlets. Yeah. So again, uh, I teach uh, at two local universities here. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I moved to Zoom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember typically, you know, a, a typical live class for me, I'd have 12 to 15 people in a class, which was perfect, perfect number of people to have in a class, lots of interaction. And then when the pandemic hit, of course, I couldn't do that anymore. So I pivoted and I thought, well, what can I do? I know what I'll do. I will move to online. And in May of 2020, I hadn't even heard of Zoom. I didn't even know what it was. Okay. <laughs> I was probably, probably like a lot of people. I don't know. What's this Zoom thing? And of course, now we're all Zoom experts, but I had my very first Zoom class in May of 2020. And I expected to maybe have 10 or 15 people like before. My very first Zoom class, I had 150 people in my webinar. Uh. 150 people signed up for my webinar. And that's when I thought, okay, one of two things is happening here. Either I'm really cool or they're just so bored, they don't have anything else to do. <laughs> Because they can't go anywhere. But that that was amazing. That was a watershed moment for me. Um, yeah. And 2020 ended up being my best year, it, at least for me personally, in terms of assets uh, under management brought in and, and growth of our firm and that sort of thing. Uh, and that was during a pandemic. But I credit all of it to a combination of teaching my classes. And, of course, we also have a, a radio show here locally in the Oklahoma City area. And those two things together really help to uh, create some synergy that uh, to this day continues to help us grow our, our practice. 
so it's a radio show, but then you you pick up clients from that as well, mm-hmm. and then augment that. Um, do you do you send the clips out of the radio show, and you do a podcast version of it, and all that? And that- yeah, yeah, we do. So the uh, the show, and we've got a little studio here in our office, and we record the show. I actually write and produce and edit the show, and I co-host the show. And uh, the local AM talk station airs it on the weekend. And then the following week, yeah, I'll send it out as a podcast. And we've got it on all the primary platforms, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts, and all those places. Great. And yeah, I'll frequently take clips of that, and I'll share it on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll send it out as drip emails to uh, our clients and the people that have signed up for our newsletter, things like that. So. We utilize it pretty heavily, nice. and, uh, you know, and then what we talked about on that show then turns into educational moments that I can use for other things I do. I do a weekly 30 minute webinar every Wednesday called the uh, Wednesday lunchtime drive through and for 30 minutes, people just log on and I talk about anything and everything that's related to money, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. But um, again, the the key theme with all this is teaching. it's teaching, providing value and information, and that just naturally turns into new business at some point. And you have quite a creative title for that radio show too, right? Yeah, it's called "It's All About the Money, Honey." I can't take right. credit for that. Uh, Victoria, our our uh, CEO and founder, she actually wrote a book. She literally wrote the book. It's all about the money, honey. And uh, then that became the radio show as well. So nice. Yeah, you know we we're not into boring titles around here. You know we we can't just come up with boring titles again. No one's gonna no one's gonna listen to a show. Uh, and I apologize to anybody out there, any advisors that have a show called this. But we're like nobody wants to listen to the financial forum. You know, I mean, and nobody wants that, right? So, yeah. And, and that's the thing is that. I think a lot of this, people want information, mm-hmm. want education, but they want to be entertained too. And part of my background is in uh, entertainment. Uh, I've done quite a bit of stage work in the past and uh, uh, music and, and theater and that sort of thing. So there's a there's an element of performance art that goes into some of this. And people like to be entertained as well as educated. So I, I call it infotainment. You know, that's that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And the Wednesday, the Wednesday show is is called, I think you mentioned it before. It's called the Wednesday Lunchtime drive through And typically it's from 1230 to 1 p.m. Central is when I okay. when I host that. Nice, nice. Well, good. So what was the latest subject in your drive through uh, Well, this past week, we actually discussed some of the uh, tax incentives that are a part of the Inflation Reduction Act that was signed in uh, 2022. And there are uh, some really cool tax incentives, credits, deductions, rebates available for home improvements mm-hmm. tied to energy efficiency. You know, so the, mm-hmm. the stress on our energy grid nationwide, uh, the rising cost of energy, and uh, so they're incentivizing a lot of uh, taxpayers to improve the energy efficiency of their home, uh, swap out their air conditioners for a heat pump. Uh, blow in new insulation, new windows, things like that, uh, incentives for solar power, that sort of thing. So we discussed that, but I've discussed a variety of topics. I've discussed investing in artwork, uh, but not actually buying the art, but there are there are like mutual funds, closed in mutual funds for artwork that you can get into. We talked about crypto. I've talked about how to cut the cable cord and you know how I did that. Mm-hmm. A variety of topics that we discuss. All sounds great, and, and you get clients from that, and, and just friends and friends, and that's uh, it's probably a great, great thing. Yeah, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah. Well, good. So, so you know, your nonprofit background that that is interesting because that must affect um, how you service clients, doesn't it? How, how might that affect your Ab- your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that I found when I worked in the nonprofit world. Of course, part of what we did a lot was try to build relationships with financial professionals, CPAs, financial advisors, uh, estate planning attorneys, for the benefit of our donors. But I also wanted 
you know, to potentially build those partnerships, to cultivate relationships with those so that maybe I could come in and do presentations and maybe their clients would become my donors. But one thing that I found was that many of those professionals did not know the language of the nonprofit world. They didn't understand what a charitable gift annuity was. Mm. He didn't understand the concept of rather than writing a check to charity, donating appreciated stock mm -hmm. to avoid capital gains taxes. Uh, and I educated many of them about that. And so, and the other thing I found was that many financial professionals don't talk to their clients about philanthropy, about the importance of giving inside of their, their overall plan. Mm -hmm. And so when I became an advisor, one of the first things I did was I reached out to all my former colleagues in the nonprofit world to say, look, you once knew me as Damon, the fundraiser. Now I'm Damon, the financial advisor. And probably more so than any other advisors, you know, I know your world. I know the challenges you're facing. I know how you're marketing to your donors. I can help structuring uh, different kinds of gifts that can benefit both your clients and the mission of your organization. So to this day, I heavily use things like, uh, you know, my clients donating the required distributions to charity. We do that all the time, uh, qualified charitable distributions. I've got clients that have set up charitable gift annuities. I've got clients that have set up charitable remainder trusts. Mm -hmm. uh, here recently, I just had a client that she wanted to donate $150,000 to our local symphony. And we, instead of her writing that check, we donated appreciated stock. Nice. To do that. And so those are the kinds of things that I talk about a lot. And of course, philanthropy is a big part of the conversation that I have with my clients, uh, especially once we've got everything else in order. Yeah. Well, and all the studies have shown, Damon, if you speak about philanthropy, your clients, um, they will take you as seriously and move significant assets to you. Yes. And uh, that's a great, it's a great area. I myself am a CAP, a Charter Advisor of Philanthropy, which you had mentioned before. And I, I chose to do that instead of CFP. So we went different directions <laughs> up and back in the same direction. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, well, good. So then, so now you get clients through this and, and you've got a profile in town. So what do you do with the clients? Do you do financial planning then with them, uh, with every client? And then how does that all work? Yeah, you know, there are elements of financial planning, of course, that we do with all of our clients. Um, every single one of our clients, and our clients tend to be uh, very near or already in retirement, getting ready to go into retirement. Uh, they tend to be in their mid-50s and older. Um, you know, they tend to have well north of a million dollars in assets. So... Mm -hmm. Every one of our clients has an income plan or a cash flow plan that we create for them. As I like to share with them, your primary goal before this point was asset management. You were accumulating assets. Now we're going to help you with your next primary goal, which is cash flow management. And that's what retirement is mostly about, cash flow management. So we yeah. build income plans for our clients um, and help them to focus on the cash flow. You know, and I, and I tell them all the time, look, if you're, if you've got your portfolio and you've got, you know, all the wonderful stocks and everything, and you think, oh, I've got all the hot stocks, but what you need is for that portfolio to generate, you know, $3,000 a month for you. And it's not doing that. Then your portfolio is not, I don't care how great the assets are. It's not doing what you want it to do. So we need to focus on income. So all one of our, every single one of our clients gets an income plan. Then from there, yeah, we handle everything. I mean, we, we are their point person for every financial aspect of their life. Nice. You, need medic, you need Medicare help? I don't do that personally, but I've got professionals in my back pocket to do. So we're going to bring them to the table to help you. I'm not an estate planning attorney. I'm not an attorney at all. But we need to get that taken care of. So here, we're going to bring two or three trust attorneys to the table, and we're going to vet them. Then you're going to get to choose. Um, do you need a CPA? Okay, here, we'll go out and vet, find a CPA for you. Um, I mean, I've got a client right now that her husband uh, passed away, sadly, last year. And part of that was the care that he received at the, the care facility. They were negligent. And some time went by. She wanted to file a lawsuit against them. So we're helping her through that process working with the attorneys 
uh, collecting all the documentation. Mm -hmm. I've never done anything like that before, but my client needed the help. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's what we do. We are, I mean, we're the financial concierge for our client, you know, and, uh, you know, you go to a five-star hotel and you go to the concierge, where's the best place in town to eat? They're not just going to say, well, we've got a few great steakhouses. No, you should go to this place right here at this corner. Here's the address. Let me call them real quick to see if there's a, a yep. reservation available. That's what we do for our clients. Very good. Very it's, good. It's anything that they need. So financial concierge, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller. I use a lot of analogies. I mean, that's how that's how humans communicate. Storytelling. Tell me a story. Show me a picture. And yeah. uh, I use that all the time when I'm talking with clients about, you know, concepts. You know, even something as simple as a bond. People hear bond. You know, what's a bond? Yeah. You know, or they'll they're hit. That, it drives me crazy. You know, a lot of our partners will put out newsletters and they use the word uh, in equities and fixed income. I'm like. Nobody knows what those words mean. Just say right. stocks and bonds, okay? <laughs> to keep it simple. Keep it to the terms and the words that normal people use. The regular, yeah. Right. You know, we don't we don't need to show how smart we are, all right? Just use normal words that people use uh, because, you know, just on our, our radio show this weekend, I said, good financial planning is not valued by the pound. All right. 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 You, you don't need a if you're if you can weigh your financial plan, if it registers on a scale, you know, it's probably a little too complicated. Uh, I'm like one piece of paper. We should we should be able to outline your financial plan on one sheet of paper, front side only, and that yeah. that should be the extent of your plan. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, it, it, it's clear then that you get the, the client's trust and, and knowledge through teaching and through storytelling. Yeah. So then once you have them as a client, how do you run the practice with your with your partner? Do you do you manage money? Do you place money with uh, other advisors, networks? Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we we work with uh, third party, uh, third party money managers. And we place those assets. Um, so we are, uh, neither one of us is uh, securities licensed. We're not series six or seven. Uh, we're series 65 only. And that's the way we like it. Um, so we do the strategy. We put that all together. And of course, we monitor those strategies. And then uh, we work with the strategists that we're using. And if they're not doing what, they, what they're supposed to be doing, then we go find somebody else. We're an independent RIA. So we, you know, we can do what we want. Mm -hmm. And, um, or, you know, for the benefit of our client, we have a pretty robust communication schedule. We meet with our clients three times a year or more as needed if something comes up, but three mm -hmm. times per year, we're pretty active uh, with videos. We use a, a service called bomb bomb where you can send mm -hmm. out short videos. I use it all the time. One minute or less, just to check in. If I haven't seen somebody in a while. Um, we have various events that we host uh, here later on in October. We're going to be, we host a Chapelwood movie night. I rent out a theater and uh, we show a movie. Last year we did uh, Avatar 2 around Christmas time. This year we're actually going to be screening uh, the new film Killers of the Flower Moon, the new Martin Scorsese movie coming out in October. It was filmed right here in Oklahoma. It's about Oklahoma. Uh, nice. In our early uh, 1920s Oklahoma, it's an interesting story, uh, and it's a great book if you haven't picked that book up, Killers of the Cloud. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's what we're going to do. So we we try to make sure that we stay engaged with our clients. Um, I mean, it, it. I would rather our clients tell us, "Look, you guys are over communicating. <laughs> right, please, please stop." <laughs> rather, than, rather than you know, we never hear from our advisor because I hear that all the time. Yeah, other, from people everybody, more. everybody complains that. Yeah. Well, you clearly have that together. Well, good. Well, um, you know, one one big change that's going on currently is um, the pandemic spending on on healthcare uh, through Medicaid is ending, and I wondered if you'd seen that and noticed that, and what what's happening in that world, uh, in the health benefits area. Uh, not not so much. I mean, that's. Uh, 
I will admit that's not an area that we focus a lot on. Uh, now, of course, on the you, you mentioned Medicaid. We don't really have any clients that are on Medicaid, but or Medicare. Certainly, we have clients that are on uh, Medicare. And yeah, we've seen uh, drug plans go up. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that the Medicare premium, uh, Part B premium, is going to go up mm-hmm. in uh, 2024. Uh, so yeah, we've got some clients, and really just inflation as a whole. I mean, over the last year, people, the clients come in for their strategy meetings. I'm I'm paying two times for my grocery bill what it used to cost me, mm-hmm. and their big question is. Is my income plan going to withstand that? I mean, have we factored this in there? And, I'm, and I have to remind them, yes, inflation is a part of this. But remember, inflation isn't 9% for 30 years, okay? <laughs> that's, that's not how this works. Uh, so whether it's uh, medical, just daily living, you know, people mm-hmm. are seeing costs go up. And yeah, we've had to help manage that. Uh, for that reason, on the medical side, that's why... I absolutely have the long-term care conversation with uh, all of our clients. At the beginning of every year, we've got a checklist. They come in for their first strategy meeting in February. We go down a whole checklist of, let's make sure we discuss all of these things and long-term care. How are you going to pay for that? You got a 70% chance of needing long-term care if you make it to the age of 65. So those are pretty strong odds. Do you have the money to pay for that, or how, are we going to get insurance, long-term care insurance, to do that? Right. And um, I, I think I think a lot of a lot of investors, a lot of retirees, they they don't spend enough time thinking about that risk, mm-hmm. a very substantial one. Well, Damon, you mentioned inflation and and the pandemic. Uh, now that we're coming out of all that, are there any opportunities that you see out there that, that you're talking to clients about uh, yeah. that relate to the changes we went through and as a country? Yeah. So, you know, at least in terms of their portfolios, we've been having a lot of a lot of conversations. Of course, you know, it's kind of interesting. 2020 ended up being a great year for the market. And 2021 was really good. So we had three really good years, 19, 20, and 21 were really good. Then, of course, 2022, not so good. So last year, in 2022, we spent a lot of time de-risking portfolios for many of our clients, shifting from growth maybe to dividend stocks. Uh, We really tried to ramp up income production for a lot of our clients, especially if they were taking distributions. Of course, now we've got some great opportunities in bonds. Uh, With interest rates so high, I mean, we got... A lot of clients that are sitting on a lot of cash. So we're looking at a lot of high yield savings accounts, uh, especially those that allow you to, you know, we've got a strategy that we use that allows them to place up to $2.5 million across 10 banks. So you got full FDIC protection, which was important earlier this year with the failure of uh, the bank failures that we saw. People were worried about that, but also higher yields. Uh, we're looking at even short-term U.S. Treasuries, you know, have been paying pretty good rates. And so we've been parking a lot of cash in these cash alternatives to try to get paid. I mean, we're getting paid to sit on our money. But now the conversation I'm having is, okay, it's looking likely that we're very near or maybe already at the end of the rate increase cycle. So it's more likely over the next 18 to 24 months that you're going to see rates start to come down. So now we have an opportunity to maybe shift from, and I don't really get too much into the weeds in this, but these are the conversations we have behind the scenes of we've shortened our duration in our bond portfolios while rates were going up. Well, now there's an opportunity to get out of those shorter term bonds, shorter duration, and look at more intermediate and long term uh, Mm -hmm. to benefit from uh, the potential for more growth uh, as we start to see rates come down probably in the next 12 to 18 months. So- Those are the kinds of conversations we have with our clients. And sometimes it's just a simple one minute video that you send out and you just let them know, hey, look, we're not out of the woods yet. We're still playing defense. We'll play offense later. okay? but we're still playing defense right now. And uh, we're going to maintain that position for a little while. But there are going to be some opportunities. So we we're staying on top of it. We are the captain of your plane. We've got this under control. We made it through the the uh, turbulence. There may still be a few bumps, but 
you're in good hands. We're going to be okay. You don't have to unretire. <laughs> you don't have to go back to work. Um, and that little bit of confidence, that little nudge, people just want to know that their advisor's looking out for them. That's all. Yeah. They're, that they're going to be okay. That's right. You know, yeah. and it's, um, there's a, uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, anyway, I, I'm a big Billy Joel fan. I love Billy Joel. Oh yeah. I, I dream myself, you know, that I could sing exactly like Billy Joel, uh, which is not the case, but, um, <laughs> there's a, there's a line, there's a song, tell her about it. Okay. And in the bridge of that song, it says, uh, you know, something because now and then she'll get to worrying just because you haven't spoken for so long. And yeah. though you may not have done anything, will that be a consolation when she's gone? That is just a great lesson for your clients. Okay. Yes. Sometimes you haven't done anything wrong. And then your client calls you and says, yeah, I'm going to be transferring my mind. You're, what? I, I thought everything was good. Well, yes. we yeah. never heard from you, you know. You cannot take your clients for granted, even when things are looking good. Exactly. Sometimes that little message is all they need to let them know that you still care. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, great. Well, this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate you being with us today, Damon. And uh, we've a lot of lessons, a uh, lot of ideas and, and how to kind of drive a practice in a certain direction. Um, you've got a really a great vibe. And uh, you're a star. You're a natural. It's a uh, well. It's good. Very good to talk to you. Hey, you know what? I, I'm I'm fortunate. Uh, I've got a great team behind me, and uh, well, they're not behind me. We all stand, you know, stand side by side. We're, we're a small team, but it's a really great team. And uh, I've been very fortunate, very blessed that uh, I, I've had these opportunities. And so I love this work. I love what I do, and uh, I love my clients. That's great. Well, there's a lot of good things happening in Oklahoma, and you're certainly one of them. So, uh, Thanks, congratulations Brian. on your success, and and uh, let's uh, let's uh, hear from all of our colleagues and their views of uh, of your thoughts. But uh, thanks again for being uh, sharing your thoughts with us today, Damon, on the Financial Advisors Workshop. Well, my pleasure, Brian. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks uh, to Damon, and and we'll uh, be back again with another interview with another really great professional, just like Damon, and uh, keep showcasing the great people that serve the public, uh, give them comfort to make sure they have income and a family life and all the things that all these great resources can buy us. And uh, you, you need a great financial advisor like Damon uh, to do that. And uh, we appreciate uh, you, Damon, and, and everybody out there in our world doing this great work. So we'll leave it there today, everybody. Thanks for being with us today on Financial Advisors Workshop. Bye-bye now. 